Hey, what's up, my Woods people? I'm Tyler Jones, and this is the Backcountry Miniseries from the Element Podcast. Casey, fill them in. Since we are diving headfirst into the backcountry hunting this season, we decided to call in some help and talk to some experts that know how to crush it in the backcountry. So make sure and subscribe, and if this is helpful, we'd love for you guys to give us a five-star rating and an iTunes review. Absolutely. Now let's get into it, because I still have a lot of Mountain House flavors to try before September gets here. <laughs> On the show today, we've got Adam Foss. Adam, what's going on, dude? Hey, man, not too much. Just uh, surviving the doldrums of winter up here in Canada. Oh, man, <laughs> the doldrums of winter. Yeah, that's pretty opposite of what we got going on. Uh, it's been in the 90s uh, all week until we had tornadoes last night. So a little bit different, but uh, y'all still got some of that white stuff on the ground, I guess, huh? <laughs> for the course um it's gone now i'm looking at a few mountains all our all our high country alpine stuff still under a good amount of snow but uh down here it is warming up and uh the days are getting longer it's the best time of year man it's like time to shake off winter yeah that's cool dude so like uh whenever winter starts to break like this what are y'all looking forward to is it fishing or is it bear hunting or what's going on yeah a little bit everything i we like just to get out i mean it's just like nice to be able to ride the bikes around and hike and camp on the weekends without uh too much uh protection and yeah it's just i, I don't know we're kind of cruising around we, we just actually picked a ton of uh morel mushrooms so we're oh. um kind of full on in that season and i don't do a ton of bear hunting but um yeah i don't know just like getting out and getting active and and getting I don't know, just like the darkness kind of weighs in on you. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, y'all are dealing with that whole, yeah, like 18 hours of darkness or whatever a day, that right. kind of stuff, and not something we understand as much. But I feel like that whole cabin fever is relative. Like around here, you know, it's like we just went through blackberry mm-hmm. season, and now it's like full-on fishing season and sunburn season, garden season, you know, and it's, it's the same yeah. feeling. It's like, man, things are alive, you know, things are popping. So it's cool. That's right. For sure, man. And well, you- go ahead. You got yourself a hunt to get ready for, too. Yeah, for real, man. And that's kind of been the the next thing is uh, I tend to not, like, get super pudgy over the winter, but, man, uh, winter weight's a thing, you know. Like, it's uh, it's kind of hard. So kind of the bigger thing right now is, like, getting ready, getting in shape, um, and uh, getting, you know, the gear together and all and just trying to uh, not to chew my fingernails just all the way into the quick, just kind of in, in anticipation for – you know september but it's kind of hard not to sometimes so pretty stoked about I, it there, there's a saying that i like to play through my head that um i think it's something like anxiousness nervousness and excitement are kind of all confused to be the same thing so like you're half you're half nervous but you're also excited and that's sort of uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's up to you to interpret interpret how uh, how those feelings make you feel and and what they drive you to do which it sounds like to call me up to talk about gear is like uh i don't know you're either going in the right direction or the wrong direction maybe I'll, <laughs> well maybe we, I'll give you. <laughs> should we be nervous or, or anxious or excited about this <laughs> uh, excited man okay, yeah. okay all right dude i'm pumped <laughs> yes no for real i mean and our goal is just to talk to people and not so much um you know like learn the ins and outs of what exact pieces to get but like maybe have a more conceptual view of like what a backcountry hunt and experience is because i mean right. yeah i've kind of got this what you might call a glory tag um but i want to go in there and, and have a great hunt and if we come out with a big bull that would be awesome right but i want to go in enjoy the experience and, and kind of really get a taste for the wilderness so and i understand that's probably something that you know a little bit of something about right so when do you think you went on your first like true wilderness style hunt um i remember i was 13 it was early september my birthday is in late september so i was like basically 14 yeah um first week of september opening season for bighorn sheep where i grew up in southern alberta in the in the archery zone the bows on outside of canmore they call it um packed in with my old man and i don't know how far back we were probably felt like a million miles and <laughs> i i think it took us 10 or 11 hours to get in there but uh i've gone back there since many many times and it's it's actually not as far as it it seemed when i was a kid <laughs> yeah um yeah i just really remember that that moment of sort of 
walking up the creek and then and then through the timber and then through the willows and then just like getting out into the alpine you know and, and sort of seeing really like what sheep country is and, and how wild it is and, and uh yeah i kind of never forget that that's never like hooked me big time just you pop into the alpine you sort of breathe that big breath of fresh air and uh and that was it, man. I just think it's like so cool. You have everything you need in your backpack and you really can kind of go wherever you want to go. And, uh, you know, you're really not going to see a lot of people. You usually, usually know people. Um, and, and that's what I love. And so, yeah, I kind of did it at a pretty young age and then, uh, just sort of took off from there for, for better or for worse. I couldn't find anything better to do with myself. And <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all the time. how'd that hunt go? Were y'all, uh, successful in harvesting a sheep? Oh, absolutely not. They say, <laughs> um, <laughs> the year you start bow hunting sheep is the year your ram is born. And usually you're trying to kill like <laughs> <That's a cool. laughs> six or seven or eight or nine or 10 year old ram. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Um, We've made all kinds of mistakes. You're talking about the right guy of how to do things the wrong way and sort of learn <laughs> from those mistakes, especially when it comes from, you know, from, from a gear and food perspective to just sort of mentally how to approach things. And yeah, yeah I mean, it, uh, yeah, no, we, we, we just, I don't know, those, those trips are, we think about it now, it's like, it was a bonus to see sheep back then and um, now it's like, yeah, we're we get a little bit more dialed in. Uh, of course, there's other factors like there's more and more hunters out in the mountains than there ever was. But um, yeah, I don't know it, it, if if you're going out um, on a wilderness hunt, especially like a wilderness bow hunt, and success is defined in taking an animal. Like you're maybe not 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 necessarily always on the right hunt because you know there's so many factors, right? There's so many factors thrown in on those types of hunts um, that uh, re- really. It's, it's not a guaranteed deal by any means. Yeah, for sure. I mean, wilderness is a special thing, and if you can't enjoy it for what it is and that the wild side that it has that you can only experience there, then you're kind of missing the point if you're just going in there trying to kill a big animal. You know, it's kind of a, a different thing. And it sounds like you got, like, that whole drive for that experience honest if your dad's carrying you at, you know, your younger teenage years into a sheep hunt. Is, is the sheep hunting thing kind of run deep in your family? yeah just my dad just started doing it um so we just kind of hunted mule deer and elk and then there's just an awesome opportunity to hunt um bighorn sheep over the counter in alberta and uh in an archery zone and you can just go you buy your tag it's 50 bucks and away you Ooh. start climbing up the mountain so um and then my i have an older brother that's two years older named cam and he uh he's super into it as well and and uh yeah, it just kind of seemed like the normal thing to do, and never really, never really thought anything of it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's the same as uh, I mean, it's a lot like like backpacking around and hiking and, and just like being out there. Like you said, it's it's sort of all those things that go into it, and hunting is just sort of the little carrot and the excuse to be out there, <laughs> yeah, um, looking around. So I'm excited for you guys. I mean, I just like talk to some people sometimes, and they're getting ready for their first mountain hunt or sheep hunt or elk hunt and uh you're sort of teetering on the edge of something this great precipice of diving into something pretty cool mm-hmm. yeah um it's almost I'm excited to, go ahead yeah no i'm excited to hear how how everything goes in the next few months and how it goes yeah on the hunt and then after sort of reflecting on it thanks man i'm almost a little bit scared that i'm going to like it beyond belief and then <laughs> it it's like a good scare. They're like what you were talking about a while ago with like, you know, the, the anxiety, nervousness and excitement. Um, there's a chance that like you get addicted to something like this. I can already tell I haven't even gone yet, but like I have to mentally prepare myself for that idea that like after this, a truck camp hunt might not be enough after that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, I'll still probably do it, but there'll always be, it's like anytime you experience something great, it's like it's hard to go back to what you once knew. So um, kind of trying to mentally prepare myself for that concept of, hey, this might be really awesome, but also be sure and just love what you've always done too. Yeah, totally. And you might end up in 
Canada or Alaska quicker than you thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I have a, a great uncle in Alaska that's uh, it's really tempting to go up there. Yeah, I, I'm not close enough, I guess, to get a uh, you know the the next of kin tag, but uh, at least have a contact and a place to stay. So uh, you never know, man. There you go. The uh, the uh, thin horned white ones up there kind of really kind of get me excited. It's kind of <laughs> dolls are like if I have a dream hunt, it'd be a doll. So. Uh, that's cool, man. That's the place to do it. So, anyways, that's the dream hunt to go on if you're a sheep dreamer, right? Is it? Is like <laughs> well, just all the a- as, apex? Just, well, just money wise, I guess. Yeah. Or anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was kind of thinking, like speaking of that, you know, you said fifty bucks for a tag, right? Not fifty thousand <laughs> earlier, right? Because <laughs> it just seems like they get more out. The prices get more outrageous every every year, man, and that's. Uh, not a fun thing to look at from my position at least, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, cr- it's pretty crazy, man. It's like a lot, it's like the cool thing to do these days. Like it the is, supply man. The, the supply of the demand is, is quite wild. And the, the other thing I think that it's on like the, the cost and, you know, you filmed a couple of stone hunts, you were saying Tyler last couple of years, you know, and so those like sheep hunts in like the Northwest Territories, Alaska and stuff, you think about the cost, it's pretty absorbing it and then you think about like the outsiders like if you think about how um how it, how much effort and time and money it takes to like get all the infrastructure i mean every nail every piece of wood every head of lettuce in your salad has been flown like multiple multiple flights or you know in the northwest territories you can't even drive there so it's everything's come up on a barge milk is 20 bucks a gallon um at the last town that you go into and then you fly in from there. Right. So, um, <laughs> the, the outfit, like it's like a $20,000 sheep hunt. It's like, they don't actually really make all that money. Mm-hmm. Um, all that much money is, is what you think. It's, it's like the, f- anyways, it's yeah. a comment on that. It's like, you're so remote, you know, it's like, it's almost like easier to get anywhere else in the world. than it is like the North tip of North America. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, anyways yeah i digress um, yeah no it makes sense for sure i mean that's I, th- I thought the same thing up there you know and and our hunt wasn't like super remote uh uh for for british columbia i guess but um you know it was it there was definitely um you know th- so many things to think about when it comes to in the outfitter buying you know buying that territory essentially in a yeah. way you know and just all the different yeah. costs man fuel uh, when you're flying and stuff like that, it's just, um, and you know, when you're looking at like sheep hunters, they kind of want, like they, <laughs> they are a type of person that t- tends to really expect results, uh, because they've probably had that in their businesses all throughout their life. And so like, you're kind of held really liable as a, as like a sheep outfitter or guide, it seems like. And so like they, you might spend money on just flying as uh, like scouting, scouting missions and that kind of thing and spending time out there in August looking for, you know, bands of rams or whatever. So I, I totally, yeah. totally see it. I just wonder like at what point does supply and demand uh, start to level out? Like are we still continuing? Is the price still going to continue up for the next decade or whatever? I don't know. That's a really good question. I think the sort of the bubble kind of seems to have to break. I mean, um, one of the big factors for Canada is the exchange rate. So right now the dollar is like 30 points. The American dollar is 30 cents in the dollar. And a lot of the outfitters just charge American dollars. So um, the Canadian economy is not doing the greatest. So the dollar is weak and they'll continue to, uh, I mean, which is actually a good thing for these outfitters as long as the American economy is doing good and they're charging in us dollars so mm-hmm. um i don't know yeah i i uh i know you guys didn't call me to talk about that stuff. no no that's, <laughs> that's just I, interesting stuff different. it is interesting man it's a it's a whole like different uh socioeconomic status and and different class of people that just kind of and i don't know intrigues me sometimes to think about man because it's like in in a way it's like you know it's just such an unknown thing to me so yeah i definitely am interested in that kind of stuff and my degree is in economics so i do have some interest there so yeah um, but well, yeah here, here's interesting one, here's one, here's one last thing for you in like the 60s um and anyone who's knows more about this that's listening that's going to correct me on this and call me out but but essentially <laughs> in like the 60s um a sheep hunt might be like a stone sheep hunt might be like let's say it's 5,000 bucks. Um, 
a new pickup truck is about five or six thousand bucks. And in 2018 or 19, let's say, the Stone Sheep Hunt is, is $45,000, let's say, $50,000. And a new pickup truck is 45000 or 50000 or, or more, depending on what kind of truck you're driving around. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, anyways, that's that's the last. last uh, yeah, dude. No, no, it's definitely, it's, you can see that, that correlation in the in scaling as, as there's been appreciation. Um, but, yeah. If you were, we're sitting on the shores of Lake Fork in Texas, and you probably, you may have heard of it, you probably don't, uh, being as far away as you are, but uh, most of the trucks around here in the parking lots uh, at the ramps are a uh, little more than $45,000. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's some oh, ridiculous like- rigs here, man, like, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 trucks with $100,000 boat, um, bass boats, yep. you know what I mean? Like, not even, they're yep. just 20, 21 foot bass boats, so it's ridiculous, yep. but... Uh, Whereabouts so, in Texas? Where in the state are you guys at? Northeast. Um, northeast. Okay. Yeah, like so, east of Dallas, uh, about seventy miles or so. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. looks looks probably a lot different than like what most people would think of as Texas. You yeah. know, when uh, Texas isn't all mesquite trees and cactus and stuff, so, and where we're at, it's you know big oak trees and a few pines and cedars scattered around and stuff. So kind of more more of the eastern look mm-hmm. and whatever kind of rolling nice. hills. But yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. But uh, it's. Um, it's different, man. It's in, uh, that's kind of, we grew up with, you know, kind of deer out the back door, nothing real, you know, no giant bucks or anything. And, uh, that's just kind of what we've known as hunting. And then as we get older and, uh, sort of mature in some ways mature at least right (laughs) um, you kind of like start looking for other things and new things. And it kind of developed into my family's been going to Western Colorado for many years and uh, kind of going up there mule deer hunting at first and then transitioning into elk and i've done a ton of truck camping hunting elk and stuff and i've I've had some success and had fun with it and then it's like okay what what else is there out there what's more fun how can i like feed this this lust for adventure and uh so and that's kind of how i ended up with the the tag and while we're talking to you it's Mm -hmm. like because we want to do that wilderness thing and uh get prepped up and do it right and not have a terrible experience because i want to have a good experience doing it so i know it takes a ton of maybe well that's not a good way to say it it's not a ton of gear but it takes some precise gear choices and expensive yeah and and somewhat expensive uh things to go into the backcountry and and have success like you were talking about while ago like this is sufficiency of having everything you need in a backpack it's kind of surreal to 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 some people who haven't done it before so let's uh yeah if you don't mind let's start with like the idea of the pack itself like what do you look for in a good backpack that's going to be kind of your lifeline for the next eight nine days right yeah i know and backpack is one of the big ones it uh it sort of dictates everything that you're gonna be able to carry it's gonna dictate how comfortable you are when you're out there it's also going to give you an idea of how much range you can get out of out of your hunt because, um, of course, from a volume perspective, how much food you can fit in is basically, you know, your sand in the hourglass of how many days you can be out there. Yeah. Um, and then you think about it all in reverse. If it can haul meat and how it hauls meat is, is how far you can go um, to, to be able to harvest an animal, especially a big animal like an elk and especially in – um, September or it's, it'd be a late September hunt, the second hunt, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's, it's going to be cool at night, but it's going to be potentially warm during the day. So you're thinking about a big animal, moving him out with two people over, you know, four loads, probably, um, two trips each. It, uh, it kind of dictates what, what you're able to do. So, yeah. um, it's, it's a, it's probably one of the most important pieces of gear. I'd say it's probably the top two or three when it comes to those types of decisions that you're making. And, um, I'm looking for number one thing is, is, is fit and comfort. And so the ability to have a backpack that, and a lot of the top end brands that are out there now do, but the ability to dial in the fit to your specific needs, you know, you might have a standard waist belt size and waist belts are pretty usually adjustable. Um, and then you're looking at torso length. And so, Um, you're able to adjust the, the, usually it's called like the yoke of a frame up and down to make it fit your body really well. Um, you're looking for this like 45 degree angle 
on your load lifters coming down to the top of your shoulder straps, which your load lifters basically is an extension of the frame. Uh, it kind of goes up above your head. You're looking for good contact and pressure from a weight perspective, evenly distributing the weight through your shoulder straps um, and down into your waist belt. And so th- that's the, that's one of the biggest things. Um, and I think it's one of the things that people often overlook. It's um, it, I think it's kind of the best way to get ready for the mountains is, is wearing your backpack with 40 pounds of concrete and the footwear that you're going to be wearing in the mountains and walking your dog, um, then walking around the park, then walking up some hills, then walking up some steep hills, then, um, having 50 pounds and then 60 pounds. And then, you know, it's sort of like three things. It's physically getting your body ready and sort of doing it in a way that is actually really applicable to the mountains, all those small little muscles and stabilizing muscles in your feet and, and calves and legs and, and back and core. Um, then mentally it's getting yourself ready. When you get at the trailhead and you have 55 pounds of stuff and you throw it on, you're not having that sort of, oh man, what do I got myself into? You're yeah. going, hey, I've, I, I've done this for the last three months and I'm ready. Mm-hmm. Um, same goes for when you throw a hind quarter of an elk that might be 80 or 85 pounds. You know, that's never going to really feel great. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it does feel great. It, it, it usually means you've been successful, but um when you throw that pack on it and you know, Hey, I've done this before. I had 80 pounds of sand or concrete in my pack and yep, I could get it on. I could stand up. I could safely walk around for a mile or two and then take a break. And, um, mentally it just allows you to be able to go, I, I, I can do this. Um, and then the third thing is it does, it just sort of breaks in the pack and breaks in your footwear. Cause those are, I think those are two of the, the ways that you're going to go horribly wrong is you're going to have a pack that doesn't fit. Um, that you haven't kind of broken in and dialed to fit in mm-hmm. or you're going to, you're going to have boots that don't, that don't work for you and you're going to have blisters. And, and those are the, the most, you know, debilitating, um, things I think that can happen on, on your first time. And those are mistakes that I've made plenty of times, you know, wrong boots, wrong boots for the application or, or new boots, you know, you wore out your old boots or you wanted it. Some, some buddy talked you into this new brand of boots and you went out and bought them and then you took them on a hunt five or six days later. Um, those are going to be the soul crushing ones. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, so, so I kind of meandered off on the back, <laughs> on the packs, but, uh, I look, look, looking for fit, adjustability, um, comfort, um, is a big thing. And, and, um, there's a lot of lightweight packs out there these days. And, you, you know, I think some companies are doing some awesome, awesome, awesome things for backpacks. And, um, the thing I keep in mind too is a, a pack that's a half a pound or a pound lighter when it's 80 pounds, it don't matter if it's 80 or 81. It's still <laughs> yeah. Hurt. Yeah. That's, um, I, I think that's a big thing that, I, and this is, you know, coming in maybe with a touch of naivete where, uh, I haven't done it much, but I'm like, man, I'll sacrifice a few pounds if it means comfort. And at the same, and it's just yeah. like what you're saying, like whenever you're talking about 1.3% of your total weight, I mean, that's not much, yeah. right? I know that there's a big difference in 25 and 45, but there's not a lot of difference in 45 and 47 or, you know, yep. 108 and 110 whenever you're trying to get out the whole thing. So I know yep. too, for like sheep hunters and a lot of times just in general, people who are going into the wilderness, uh, you're going to go back a long ways and the concept of being able to put a lot of stuff in the pack as far as like meat goes and, and not have to do two, maybe three trips is pretty important. Uh, and I know like a lot of times with sheep hunters, it's like you're taking everything on the way out. Right. So, um, how do you manage those super heavy loads whenever you're talking and I don't really know like what, what is if say, if you're doing like a, a solo bighorn hunt, right. And you, you want to take, cape uh, skull horns and the meat out you know what's that load look like and then how do you manage that load on your back yeah no that's a that's a good one i think um yeah horns hide boned out meat might be uh i would say yeah you could be like 80 or 90 pounds of just that stuff yeah maybe 50 50 pounds of boned out meat the head's going to be 20 or 25. The cape's going to be, I don't know, five or seven, depending if you cape it or not. But yeah, so, something like that. Um, and then, of course, your camp, your weapon, your optics, all that stuff. The mm-hmm. nice thing is about about those sort of things is if you're in a jam, you can always leave that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, you want to get um, 
the meat out as quick as you can. And it depends on where you are. I don't know the regs in, in New Mexico and Montana elk hunting the the head has to be the last thing that comes out. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you know, but you can, you can leave, um, you know, your hunts over, you can leave your bow up there. You can leave your, um, whatever your optics, you know, that that's nice thing. Those are non-perishable things that you can do. Uh, but yeah, so, so, so that might be 80 or 90 pounds and then your gear, your camp, whatever else, you know, it can easily be another 40 or something like that. Um, if you, if you, uh, are that loaded down and every situation is different. Um, it, when you're by yourself, um, you know, I always seems to, you always seem to want to just load, load up, but, um, it is kind of dangerous too, right? If, if you do hurt yourself or something and when you do have a heavy pack, that's probably the most likely time that something bad could potentially happen. Yeah. Um, so I always think it's kind of better just to be careful and take two loads when you're by yourself. Um, and, and so, yeah, with an elk, I mean, you guys have to do with two guys, you have to do two trips and that's two heavy, heavy, heavy trips. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it might actually look more like three by the time you grab, um, camp, you, you know, and if you have whatever, however, however heavy or light you go and however far you in, yeah, you really can't, you can't really do, I mean, maybe you kill one mile from the truck or something like that. You could do it. And I don't know. I just don't even think it's even worth it. Just do it in two trips and yeah, probably sure. three, three with camp. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those are going to be, those are going to be plenty heavy. Yeah. So how, how after you, um, or like what percentage of hunts do you do? Maybe, um, however you want to answer this question where you're, cause we've had some people that suggest like, Hey, put three or four days worth of food in your pack and, and take off and do a loop, come back, uh, after three or four days. If you, you know, if you feel like you're not on the elk or obviously you're going to have to come back to get food, even if you're on the elk, like how after you to do that versus like, just take, you know, a few days worth more meals because you're kind of going to have everything else. You're going to have it, whether you're doing four days or eight days. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, sort of situational dependent, but the nice, the nice thing you gotta keep in mind about food is it gets lighter every day as you eat it. Right. Yeah. right. Um, and so if you're between two and a two, two and two and a half pounds of food a day, which is kind of where you're probably going to end up landing, depending on what you like to eat, how much, you know, four extra days, that's only eight extra pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, that's assuming there's going to be lots of water where you guys are going to be at. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it really, it really just depends. I like on something like a sheep hunt where it's like, it's a, it's, it's, it's a lot more visual and you know, you have a lot more sort of dehabilitated things sometimes like weather happening. Um, I, you know, this sort of the style that, that I subscribe to the people at home subscribe to is like, you know, get in, if you can, if you can swing it, get seven or eight or nine days of food on your back and just go, um, and sort of, pick off these drainages and hunt these ridges and just kind of keep going and hunt your way methodically through an area mm-hmm. for something like personally, for something like elk, I would maybe, you know, do the, do the three or four day th- thing because it's more of a, you know, sort of an audio game where you're going to get in and you're going to know in the, in the early mornings and evenings, whether or not there's elk there, you're going to hear them. Right. And so you maybe want to think about going into a spot, um, and it's not like, you know, we're going to be sitting there glassy for two or three days waiting for a sheep to pop out of the timber. You're going to hear them right away if they're yeah. there. Yeah. Um, and if they're not, it's like, you know, move on. If you're mm-hmm. not seeing the sign or hearing elk, I would, and it's the peak of the run, you know, second, third, fourth week of September, whatever, keep moving. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it just depends on the area, you know, if it's a big wilderness area where you can just keep going and going and going, um, maybe, ca- maybe you carry your seven days of food or if you sort of park at a trailhead that's sort of central and you're like, okay, we're going to hit this drainage and we're going to hit this drainage. Um, and there's other reasons to come back, you, you, you know, you can, you can always do that, but I'd sort of let the, the species and terrain dictate exactly what to do on, on that front. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so I kind of have a two part question with that. So, uh, being that it's a place we've never been to, when you're talking about letting the species in terrain, like I understand the species, I've hunted them, uh, but yep. I've never hunted this terrain before. So do you feel that it's pretty imperative to to go and like understand that terrain before you get there, like pre-scout or go in and, uh, you know, maybe do like a backpack trip through the area and get familiarized with stuff? That way you're not surprised when you show up. 
you know what? I mean, that's ideal, right? Yeah. I mean, that's ideal. Of course, we're all limited <laughs> by the constraints of, of time and resources and money that we have to mm-hmm. be able to go do these things. Um, ideally, you know, you know, you get a lot of value from just driving around, see, you know, all those little things that you don't really notice that, uh, Oh, there's a, there's a, there's, there's water in this Creek now. And, uh, I know in September there might not be, or, um, you know, actually that sign for this trailhead is, is two miles off and the real trailhead is right here. And you kind of get into the area, even just drive around and look around, you'd learn some of those things. If you don't have the time, it is what it is, right? You're still going to go hunting. Um, yeah. And maybe you, you build in an extra couple of days on the front end knowing, you know, it's going to be a little tomfoolery at the beginning, kind of going, all right, like, you know, just sorting sorting everything out. The, the nice thing is it's like so much you can do with just Google Earth these days. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and you can learn access points and, and sort of what might work and where water might be, where, you know, north-facing dark timber, shady pockets are that elk might be hanging out when it's hot and you can sort of have those like points of interest and uh, zones to go into and trails to access you know 75 percent dialed at least um at least you think you have it dialed just from the front end so Mm -hmm. i'd say perfect world yeah you get there and get boots on the ground um but you know if that's not realistic there's a lot you can do with google earth and a lot you can do with getting on the phone and talking to people and talking to biologists and that sort of thing to get you get you started off the right foot yeah yeah yeah. and that's kind of the the idea of a perfect world where i'd like to make it out there in august and i'm kind of planning on doing so but it doesn't mean it's going to happen i mean i you know i have a day job right and uh yeah if you have stuff going on you gotta you know get ready to actually take off the nine ten days to go on a hunt like this like it's you're gonna have to do some other prep work at home for that uh but uh it's cool but like you're talking about with the map stuff like I've been using the the Onyx layer that has the actual distances on trails. So you take off on this trailhead, and if you stick to the trail, it tells you, you know, down to the tenth of a mile how far it is until it intersects another trail. And it's, like, super helpful whenever you're looking at a landscape and thinking, okay, I can tell pretty easily how far it is as the crow flies, but what's it actually realistically take to get, you know, to that spot? Um, Now, kind of along that note – how often do you feel like, you know, when you're heading into a wilderness area or a backcountry hunt, whatever it might be, and you've got, you know, a trails map or whatever, how much do you stick to those trails to, like, get to a point that you're trying to get to? And how often are you just going cross-country and saying, ah, I can kind of pick out this ridge line and walk down this and just kind of go your own way? Yeah, that was a good question. Uh, really depends sort of the area and and the level of remoteness and infrastructure that's in place and so some spots where you might hunt elk in the lower 48 they might be hiking trails mountain biking trails you might see soccer bums walking up there with their starbucks you know when you, <laughs> when, you when you stage at the at the trailhead yeah and so those trails might be really good they might be good little super highways to get you back there and hit some zones that you want to hit um and then some might be so much more remote where there isn't even really a trail and and you're trying to you know again i'm gonna answer let the species and terrain sort of dictate that um for like sheep usually we're trying to get like as high as we can as quick as we can Mm -hmm. um get on top look down and everything you know let sort of the eyes do the walking so to speak and for elk i think it's a lot less that game it's sort of trying to get into prime uh habitat where elk are going to be running and you can do that by walking in there and you're going to know if you're hearing them um and you feel like it's the rut's happening um you're going to know if they're there right away. Yeah. And so um, to answer your question, yeah, I think I would use trails as sort of little super highways to get going and then I would get off them as quick as you can because, yeah. you know, there's spots that I've hunted where um, it might not be that far um, from from a highway or from a road, but it's like, it's like two miles straight up over deadfall and then, you know, it leads into this like pocket of, of awesome hunting. You just got to think about what people aren't really willing to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that is getting off the trail. And so I would say, you know, don't take that as a hard and fast rule, but just think about what are other people going to be doing and, and, and elk and all animals are going to want to be where there is as least disturbed as they can possibly be. And so, um, I don't know if you think about taking those, those trails and then going, all right, this, this little bowl back here looks really good. It's going to be a mile of uh bush bash and 
dead timber hawking, but like we, we think that uh, we like how it feels by looks back there. Uh, I wouldn't be afraid to do that because you know, lots of those little pockets all, all get discovered and uh, everybody else is going to be coming right on the trail right behind you to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know how limited the tags are or what's going on. You know, when you're hunting over the counter in Colorado or something, like you said, you kind of have to think outside the box and think yeah. about spots that uh, people aren't going to be necessarily going to. Yeah, right. and the the tag that I drew, I think, is like a touch less than 4% odds or something like that. So it's it's you know pretty tough to draw, but at the same time, there's going to be some people around. And New Mexico yeah. is, uh, what, 85% resident tags, 83%, something uh, like that. Yeah. So like there's going to be – uh, quite a few residents around but i believe they're going to treat it a little bit different than what i do they can draw it like every three years so for yep. me it's once in a lifetime for them it's you know oh well yeah johnny hunted this hunt three years ago and uh, killed a bull here you know a mile and a half from the truck and so i think that um at least where i'm at right now is try to go a little bit deeper than most people are willing to go but also avoid like going back so far that you're running to outfitter camps and you're not being logistical with what you can get done. You know what I mean? So that's yep. kind of where we're at. We're trying to keep everything, like all options open because I'm not going to lie. If there's a bugler uh, half a mile from the trailhead, I'm going to go after him. I'm not just going to go deep just to try to <laughs> make it happen. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And keep, keep in mind those little off, off the beat track little spots. Like it, uh, just cause you're 10 miles deep, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good and uh you can be walking by great elk habitat you know every step of the way and you can also be hunting exactly where other people are hunting because they're thinking the same thing that you are but those little those little offshoot spots or spots you got to climb you got to climb and drop into to get to people just like they're just not really willing to do that as much it just it just narrows down the number of people um that that will be in those spots it seems like yeah yeah with that being said are you um i guess it's called bivy hunting i don't know sorry if my t- terminology is wrong but like <laughs> are you hunting with camp on your back every day usually and just setting up <laughs> at the last place that you feel like you know where they're going to be kind of thing so you have advantage in the morning yeah no and, and so so for sheep hunting and, and high alpine stuff yes pretty pretty much um pretty much unless you get to an area that's like okay it's gonna take me a day or two to kind of look this all over um but usually moving every every you know day or two um if we're not seeing anything for something like elk i i and i'm not an expert elk hunter by any means i've done a little bit of it um i think it behooves you to sort of get into a spot where there's elk and 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 there's water and you know leave camp on water close to a water source and elk hunting all the way I think about it, it's like a sprint and, and mountain and sort of sheep hunting is like a marathon. It just seems like elk hunting, you're just like up in the morning, early, you're chasing the elk down, you're running to, to cut them off before they're heading up to their bedding area. Um, I, I think it's like it, once you're in the zone, once you're in the spot where there's elk, um, I would personally leave camp by water and then just have your day pack and go chase them around and, and, and get into them. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know you know you could have camp with you the whole time and just sort of keep going, but um, it just seems like sometimes you got to make moves. You got to you know you just kind of get these animals pattern. You know where they're going. They're going to water. They're like I said, they're going to bed, or you know they kind of traverse along this trail every time. And I, I don't know. Sometimes you have a full pack on. It's like, oh man, I don't know if I can run up there and cut these things off. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So so yeah, and, and if you're not into them, I, I wouldn't you know. I wouldn't camp where there's no elk. I mean, if, you, if you're in a spot and there's daylight and you don't have any elk around you that, that you can see or hear or smell, you know, I'd say, hey, just kind of keep keep picking along and, and or maybe plan that morning to break camp and throw it on your back and say, we're just going to keep going until we get an elk. And once we get to that zone, then we'll camp there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that's – I like the flexibility idea you're talking about because that's how I like to hunt. You know, a lot of guys have, like, their style of what they're going to do when they go in there. And – uh, I've been saying since uh, the day I drew the tag, I want to keep all options open. And there's some yep. things I'm going to have to close up before we go, like and like the whole idea of like which pack I'm going to get and stuff like that. But as far as hunting strategy goes, um, it might be a little bit uh, reckless, but honestly, I kind of want to show up, pick a spot on the map that I think is going to be pretty good kind of before we go and go in there and just see what the elk tell me to do. You know, And maybe, yeah. maybe that might be the best thing to do. 
uh, I, you know, understanding different tactics, different ideas is probably a good thing, and knowing how to do those effectively, yes, but deciding on one out of the box or out of the gates is probably not the, the best thing because you end up pigeonholing yourself. But, you know, a while ago you were talking about uh, sprint versus marathon, right? It was sheep versus elk. And um, to continue on with that analogy, in a sprint versus a marathon, your footwear is going to be drastically different because you need different things for it, right? So um, when you're sheep hunting as opposed to elk hunting, do you change the types of footwear that you're using? And then along with that, what are you using for those different hunts? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Yes, the short version is yes. The longer version is usually it's just a couple of factors you're looking at sort of sheep, high alpine. You're looking at um, usually a generally a heavier overall pack carrying eight or 10, 10 days of food. Yeah. You're looking at like talus and scree and sharp rock. Um, you know, you're looking at potentially, potentially for sure you're going to get some rain. You might get some snow. Um, so those are all factors where like full on mountaineering boots, um, are, are a pretty good option with gators. Whereas elk hunting generally like in the rut, um, a lot of times it can, weather can be great, although it can always snow in September. Um, but, but you're, you're sort of thinking about, okay, I need to be able to go light fast. Um, the other thing is like boots are just really not very quiet. Um, when you're sheep hunting and you're putting a stock on a sheep or, or a goat or something, it's usually windy. Their hearing honestly isn't really that good. They've got small little ears if you look at them from a, <laughs> just a, a body composition perspective. Their number one defense is, is vision. So they have basically the equivalent of 8x42 binoculars in their eyeballs. Um, sheep do. So they're, so they're trying to see you and smell you. They're not really trying to hear you. And there's actually lots of different noises going on. There's rocks rolling and avalanches and other sheep moving around. So, so sound isn't a big thing, but with elk, you know, they're cued in and you're in that timber. It can be quiet. They're listening for elk moving around. They're listening for bulls coming in, sneaking in the back door and stealing their cows. Like they are queued up. And so I think, you know, sort of like a crossover type, uh, running shoe or trail shoe is, is a pretty good option. Um, I've worn different ones from different companies like La Sportiva or Solomon, um, th- that sort of lend themselves. They're not really quite a boot. They got a little bit of traction and honestly, just for a sheer heavy pack, um, meat packing perspective, they're not the best footwear, but for hunting elk, I yeah. think that they are because you're going to be a little bit faster and, and yeah, like I said, quieter, um, and, and it's going to be hot and you're going to be running and gunning and it's just, it's just kind of nice to have like a, you know, you can just do like a Gore-Tex trail shoe. You can try them on. You can do sort of like more of a hybrid low, um, sort of low ankle boot, um, again, like lots of co- different companies make them but i would say try them out if you got weak ankles or you, you know if you just play bas- basketball or something um you probably want the support of, of a more more serious um sort of mid-level boot if you're uh if you're good to go and you want to try the trail running um trail shoe platform out I, that's where i would personally lend to and then so she probably had something more uh, of a really stiff shank and gray ankle sport um because yeah you're just kind of dealing with like a little bit different different terrain um but but number one thing just like packs is like get in there try them out wear them as many many miles as you can with your pack on and then you're gonna you're gonna kind of know pretty quickly whether or not um that program's gonna work for you when you throw your pack on and how it feels all yeah. kind of set dude, up ready to go you're my man that's what i'm talking <laughs> about the trail runner dude like I've I've been asking this question to several people we've interviewed for this podcast and, and or for this series and pretty much hardly anybody has done has talked about the trail runner thing and for me like I have a really narrow foot and yeah. so I feel like I get a lot of like heel slip uh, in boots especially uh, especially like going uphill it feels like and um, and and like I've I've worn um, some kind of those like hybrid um, and they're cheap but they're like Columbia. Um, yep. you know, hybrids or whatever, like trail runner type boots. And they're like the most comfortable things I've ever put on my feet. And I don't have, not that, you know, as soon as I say this, I'll go off and have a hind quarter on my back this, this summer and, or this September and twist my ankle or something, but I really don't have, have never had ankle issues too much. And so it's good yep. to hear that for sure. But like, I know you mentioned the, you know, packing weight is—is is that the main issue that you're talking about with the trail runner? Is—is is like the support for ankle, or is it something else? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. ankle support and just just like footbed stiffness. So, 
you know, when you kind of edge into a steep hillside or, you know, you're side hilling, um, mm-hmm. the, the stiffness, the foot bed of a, you know, the shank of a boot and the last and how it's built are going to be, are going to be better. For I that. got you. No question. Um, you know, and that's the thing about gear, right? It's like all these things are personal choices. All these things you're, you're giving up something to gain something else. Mm-hmm. And it's all about sort of your priorities and how you think about things. And, um, with, with the boots, yeah, you're, you're giving up some of that stability for what I think, or I always think about like this too, like the number one goal is the, the, the priority is, Hey, we're there to kill an elk. And one of the biggest things I think is, is in elk hunting is kind of being quiet. And so I think a trail runner is going to let you do that. Therefore, personally, I'm willing to make the sacrifice of ankle support and stiffness to gain, you know, great, greater quietness on, on the stop. Mm-hmm. There's other things you can do too, is if you, if you don't want to do that, if you're like, Hey, I, don't, I am only comfortable wearing boots. I got a great pair of boots. Uh, we're going to be on some steep stuff. I don't like the idea of trail runners. You, you know, you can do something like you wear your boots, you throw, you know, there's like those safari sneakers you throw on over top, or I actually got a pair of these, um, stockasins of this last time I was on my buddy Sloan gave them to me and they're like a leather moccasin basically they're pretty badass so you can have those in your pack when you're in close you throw them on you take your boots off you throw on these little leather booties um and you go from there um elk hunting always seems to get away from me because it's like not like you're stalking a bedded animal or like you know okay i'm gonna last like 100 yards of the stock i'm gonna put on my my leather booties and be super quiet it's like they're kind of moving around and you're chasing them so that doesn't necessarily always work i've done like a lot of miles with bare feet uh, sock feet, I should say, uh, hunting elk, I throw my pack off and, and throw my boots off. And then I'm like, why did I ever take my boots off? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but there is other options you can do. I would just say the caveat to all of it is try it out, try it out for yourself, see what works. Um, but, but, but yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff is there's things you think you need. You, you think you need a, you know, a serious boot. You think you need a four season 10. You think you need all these pieces of gear and, and you do, I mean, you don't need them until you need them, but it's like all these like calculated risks and, and sort mm-hmm. of, Hey, I can make that sacrifice. I know that I'm willing to prioritize this particular thing on this particular hunt. And I'm going to choose this particular piece of gear to allow me to do that. Yeah. Do you, so do you use insoles ever? Yeah. I use a few different ones. I've used, um, I, I don't know. I've used like all different kinds, honestly, but usually I just try and get like a pretty cheap pair of, I think uh, like Red Wing shoes makes them. They're just like a green kind of additional cushion and support um, insole. And I just try them out. I, you know, usually the stock insole on most footwear is pretty crappy, so I'll either take that out and put more of a cushioning insole in, or I'll use both. I'll try it out with the socks that I'm going to be wearing on that hunt. I'll go there in the store with all that stuff, like uh, with the socks that I'm going to wear, or I'll buy a pair of socks in the store. I'll try different insoles. I'll try and figure it out. Um, and get as close to comfortable as I can. I know we use like super feet in the past and I've, yeah, I've kind of used a little bit of everything, but uh, again, feet super personal and, and very different challenges depending on how narrow or wide or, or long or stubby or weird your hobbit feet are. You need to just kind of go in there and try it on yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. makes sense, man. No. Yeah, totally. Um, so say you've been on your feet all day, you've had a long, long walk in or out or whatever it might be maneuvering in and out of, uh, boulders. Um, uh, what do you like to sit down to a hot bowl of in the evening <laughs> high on the mountain? Yeah, no, I think it's an age old debate. It gets asked around <laughs> many a backcountry hunting camp. Um, you know, I, it's pretty cool to see a, a lot more different companies are popping out of the scene that are making freeze dried. Um, you know, the traditional mountain house lived off those for a long, long time. Uh, Backpackers Pantry is sort of the second most popular, biggest company, but there's a bunch of different companies. Um, there's, uh, they're making these offerings. Um, and some of them are kind of geared at the honey, um, honey market. I think there's a company called off grid food co. I just had, I was down on a trip and, uh, and it was awesome. Um, they had like bison pulled, pulled bison, Mac, three cheese, Mac and cheese. They had Ooh. like, um, what else did they have? Like Thai curry with quail, I think. Mm. They had some awesome ones. So, so there's a lot of different companies. And um, yeah, I like, I, I mean, I'm kind of just looking for like maximum calories, minimum weight usually. Um, 
but uh, I don't know, a little bit of variety in there is nice too. You kind of get sick of the old uh, the old staples, but um, yeah, varied degrees of freeze dried. Uh, one thing you can do if you're hunting with a partner or a couple of people, if you really want to save on volume and you save a little bit of weight, but more volume is you can take. Let's say you're having mac and cheese. You and I are both having one. We're hunting partners. You can empty those two mac and cheese mountain house packets into like a Ziploc bag. And so those freeze dries come with quite a bit of air in them. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you empty them in a Ziploc bag, kind of like squeeze the air out or suck the air out, you basically cut your volume in half and you save a little bit of weight with the packaging. And there's that little oxidizing package in there as well. Um, So you can do that. You can add... You can get olive oil packets from Mount, from from Amazon and throw them in your mountain house, and and like those fats and oils are going to be the highest calorie per ounce thing that you're going to have, and and so we always sort of supplement that uh, with some olive oil, especially on longer hunts. Like you're going to lose weight, um, no question, and and every every bit of food on your back sort of has to be fuel for the hunt. You don't want to kind of run out. So there's a couple things you can do, um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it changes. I'd say mac and cheese is my favorite overall. That's pretty good. Just we heard staple. that from somebody else, yeah. I think, too. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to beat mac and cheese whether you're at the house or you're in the mountain. <laughs> you know, it's pretty tasty. Have you ever, uh, like, think about or even rely on being able to shoot, like, small game when you're in the backcountry? You, you know, these are just some grouse hanging around. You got to check the regs and see if you can hunt them. Or, um, yeah, we have for sure. Yeah. Um, do you equate it into your, like, into your food intake, like, assuming you're going to be able to shoot some? Not, not really. Uh, I never have, but um, yeah, I mean, you always, you always, you know, a lot of, a lot of rough grouse. Are, uh, many an elk hunt has been ruined by a rough grouse hunt. I can oh tell yeah, you I know, man. It's it always turns into a grouse <laughs> hunt every time you see one. Like, oh look, <laughs> and many, uh, many a uh, twenty dollar arrow has been lost to a grouse as well. <laughs> that is true. Um, but yeah, no, if you can, if it's legal and they're there, I would say you know, go for it. That's kind of fun. And they taste really, really good too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Now that's cool. What about, um, as far as like, you know, you were talking a lot earlier about camping near water and this and that, are you looking for, um, specific types of water sources to use as like camp water and stuff? And then how are you filtering or treating or whatever on that stuff? Yeah, no, um, usually just looking for running water if it's at all available. Um, uh, fortunately, a lot of stuff in the north, you're like looking at the glacier or the snow that's melting yeah. <laughs> into the creek, and you just you just drink it. I've never gotten sick. Touch wood. Oh, that's um, nice. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, anywhere you're hunting, hunting in the timber and cattle country and stuff like that, you want to be filtering your water. I mean, I mean, I kind of use everything. Um, right now, I kind of alternate between two filters. One's like a Sawyer. It's called. It's like an, an ounce and a half or two ounces it just squeezes onto the threads of like a platypus bag and you kind of squeeze it out. That's good for like individual use. It's not, not too bad. Um, and then the other one that I just got, it's called um, a company called Geiger makes them and and they make a whole system for, it's like a hydration bladder and you can plug in a filter in line into your hydration bag. And so you sort of have these two tubes. You have one tube running out, attach your backpack strap. It's like your bite valve and water's going to come out of that. And the other tube is like a, like basically like a pump. Like, uh, you would go to the doctor's office and they'd read your blood pressure with, you know, sort of like a black rubber pump. Um, that is pressurizing this bag and pushing the water through the filter. So, um, you're drinking filtered water all the time, but you can kind of just like throw your pack down, scoop it up with water and then go rather than sitting there on the Creek, like pumping water. Um, so I've been liking that option with two guys. Usually, you know, that's a nice thing about two people. You're splitting, you're splitting the stove, you're splitting water filters, splitting, you know, a spotting scope. If you're bringing one, which you're probably not, if you're out cutting, cause you're probably not looking that far, but <laughs> you're splitting a two man tent. You have these things that you sort of have this scale of advantage of, of hunting with a partner. And so you can bring a little bit, maybe better water filter. That's more built for like, pumping massive qualities of water rather than just kind of individual use yeah um but um yeah i mean just looking for running water and uh and you know you're probably gonna go through a lot of it so um you never really want to run out and a good filter is something that uh will allow you to do that do you ever uh okay this is kind of strange and a little bit counterintuitive but 
I am a water guzzler. I mean, I drink a ton of water. We live in humid country. You sweat a lot. You know, you got to drink a lot. Uh, do you ever condition yourself to maybe not take in as much water before you go up there? Because, I mean, honestly, I, I'd probably drink a gallon or a little over a day. Um, yeah. You know, but, like, sometimes it's just not that readily available, especially if you're talking southern latitudes, to or feasible to, you know, gather a gallon of water a day. Do you ever condition yourself or try to just ration water like that? Yeah, I never have. Um, it's one thing that uh, I just know that I don't do that great in the heat and in the desert. And, um, yeah, it's sort of the one thing you just – it is what it is. It's heavy. It's 2.2 pounds a liter or, you know, it's you know for a gallon, it's basically eight or nine pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just is what it is. I haven't ever conditioned it. But, but um, yeah, you just need to – you just need to drink it when you got it and carry it when you don't. And, uh, yeah, I think you're about spot on. I think four liters a day or a gallon is kind of minimum. And then you got some water for cooking and get by. I think you'll get by with that, but, um, it just depends on your activity level. It depends on how hot it is and, uh, and those factors, but those, uh, I'll kind of, those are long days too, right? Like you, you yeah. might be out, you're going to be out before sunrise and you might be out long after dark, kind of get back to camp. So, um, yeah, as much as you can carry that you feel comfortable with, I'd say I'd say have it with you. Yeah. So after after cooking dinner and uh, getting all your water put together for the night, usually like the next thing that comes is the is sleep and the motif that we hear across this series is how important that is. Um, so like, what does your system look like? Your bag, your pad, your tent. What does all that look like right now? Yeah, I run uh, depending on the trip. Um, a Hilleberg tent, which they just kind of make, in my opinion, kind of the best um, tents for sort of the stuff that I like to do. And, and you know, they offer a lot of different options and levels of protection um, that you may or may not need on Elkhorn, honestly. I mean, if it's if it, the weather's good, you could be running a, a bivy sack or a tarp or whatever. My personal preference is, like, not to usually skimp too much on tents because um, – the weather can change in an instant and it's pretty nice to have like that as your home base uh, have a decent tent so i run one of, of many different hilberg options depending on whether i'm with somebody or by myself or it's a three season or four season or what i'm doing but um and then my pad is a thermarest um x therm which is like the highest um r value to weight pad um around i think it's like 16 ounces and an r value of like 5.6 or something oh, wow. like that. Yeah. Um, and my sleeping bag, I I actually kind of have a few depending on the trip too, but like a 20 degree is what I'm running right now. I run in a 15 degree um, from Stone Glacier I have as well. But, um, and then I have like a zero degree that um, for the later season stuff. But, uh, and then probably the most important thing is a pillow. You can get these little inflatable ones. I think mine's like a, from a company called like Cocoon or something little inflatable pillows you stuff it up in the hood of your sleeping bag and you will thank me that you brought that <laughs> yeah I've, i got one for the trip man i've nice always done the wad up a hoodie and put it under your head kind of thing you know but like i finally got got one and um i'm pretty excited to try it out because uh i don't i'm a light sleeper and so every little thing wakes me up so i need as much comfort and peace as possible i feel like and um you know, you mentioned the the bivy earlier, and one thing I've heard about the bears in New Mexico is that they think that you're a human burrito, <laughs> and so I've decided I'm with you on the tent thing for sure. Yeah, I just never thought that that was that, that great of an experience. You got bugs flying around. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just a thin layer of like nylon ripstop, but that seems to at least mentally protect you more from a bear than uh, just being out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the open. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know, I've kind of tossed around the tarp idea and thinking about doing that. Um, I really want to get it and try it out some before I commit to it on a backcountry hunt. And I think, I don't know, I think that's one of the things that I'm learning. And not that I I can't speak as like an expert on this, but I think that um, getting everything it takes for a backcountry hunt and then using it before you're actually like depending your life on it. Um, yep. It's going to be a big thing, and like learning how to do this stuff, and like for instance, know how to set it, you know, pitch a, a tent with trekking poles or whatever. Um, 
before you get in there in the dark trying to do it. You know, I, I think that trying to just have practice at this stuff is going to be pretty important. No, totally. Yeah. And I think you're going to make mistakes. So try to make them as much as you possibly can before you're actually on the hunt. Yeah. Um, yeah. All, all those things, get it, get it, even go for a hike, go for an overnight, get that stuff set up in your backyard, whatever you got to do. And then, like I said earlier, like get that pack and your boots and anything in it that, that you might be carrying or just throw concrete in it, whatever, and get moving around with that. Cause like, I think you're just going to kind of assess out all those different options and, and make all those mistakes before you actually, you know, when it counts. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, you have had a ton of good advice, man. And it's mm-hmm. good to talk to somebody who really roughs it and understands like what it takes to live out there. And we can't thank you enough. But uh, if, if one of our listeners wants to uh, connect with you, follow you, see what you got going on on uh, the daily or weekly, where can they find out more about Adam and maybe what you got going on? Yeah, you bet my, um, yeah, you can find me on, on our website. Our website is just Foss dot media just my last name um you can check us out on instagram my handle is fossman8 number eight f-o-s-s-m-a-n is the number eight usually try to keep up with things on there although sometimes go off the grid for a while and don't um and then yeah check out the companies that we work with the sick of gear is a clothing company that we worked for a long time yeti coolers is a great company that supports what we do um check out gerber knives and tools they're they're awesome um equipment that that help us do what we do and um yeah we kind of are really lucky to know all these great people that we've met along the way and and these companies that support what we're up to from a film and photography perspective and from a hunting perspective and uh and also trying to keep this thing called hunting and, and wild places and public lands around for um our kids to see it right so um, yeah 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 Ch- check them out and support them where you can and uh and uh good luck yeah i'm excited to hear how everything goes and, and uh when you end up buying a house in alaska or canada or wherever you can, <laughs> yeah. or, or just never coming back <laughs> you can blame your, your family can blame me I'll, that's right i'll send them your way <laughs> that's right yeah awesome dude well thanks uh we'll keep you posted on how the hunt goes and stuff and uh um, keep us uh, posted, and I can't wait to see how your season goes. I know the sheep stuff is kind of one of the first things to kick off, so looking forward to uh, living vicariously through what you got going on. Yeah, rock and roll, guys. Yeah, thanks for reaching out, and uh, good luck. All right, All you right, too, man. bro. We'll see you later. Okay, bye, guys. See ya. Man, that was some killer info. If you found this interview helpful, be sure and leave us a review below and comment what you thought was the most helpful tip from this episode. For sure. Make sure you also follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram, and also subscribe on YouTube so you can see how these hunts turn out. Remember, this is your element. Live in it. (laughs) Been waiting my whole life for that.